then that gets us to Stalin. Who is Stalin? Right? And Stalin is another case of like if you go to the if you go to the library, you go to the not the library really, but if you go to the if you go to Barnes and Noble, you will find all kinds of books about Stalin that are that are, I mean, it's just so ridiculous. It'll be little anecdotes that people said. You'll just get this image of this monstrous, brutal tyrant who ate, ate little babies for dinner and had blood dripping down his throat and had vampire teeth. And, you know, I mean, you'll get this over-the-top caricature. And the sad thing about, you know, if you, ever, if you ever read anything about Stalin, okay, I'm not going to get into, you know, what happened when Stalin was the leader of the Bolsheviks. I'm not even going there. But it's like Stalin was wildly popular when he was running the Soviet Union. And it's still to this day, he's very, very popular in Russia, number one. And number two, he was very, very effective as, an, as a political organizer before the Bolsheviks took power. He was a very, very, very effective political organizer. So if, if there was nothing good that he ever did, if he was just this caricature of evil, who just sat around and was evil all day long, and how can I kill more people today? You know, if that's, that's who he was, why do people still love him? Why was he able to get so many people to follow him? Why was he, you know, why, why was he so effective uh, in, in organizing and building the Bolshevik party before the revolution? You know, I mean, this, this was a guy who obviously had a lot going for him. And you know what drives me crazy? You know what drives me absolutely crazy? I'll just say this, is that what I just said about Stalin, that, okay, put aside, I'm not going to argue, we're not going to argue about Holomador and gulags, I'm not even going to go there. I'm not, I'm not interested in talking about that. Right now we're talking about personalities, okay? Right? So let's just put aside, let's put aside, I'm not going to engage in the historical debate of what, what I, I, I'm not doing that, right? We can agree that a lot of people were in gulags who didn't belong there. We can agree there were some pretty bad famines that, that happened because the country was barricaded and because they were struggling to industrialize and collectivization. So I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna have that argument here. Put the, all of that aside, right? I'm sitting here telling you that Stalin, in order to do what Stalin did, in order to industrialize the USSR, in order to defeat the Nazis, in order to build the Bolshevik party as effectively as he did, he must have been very charismatic and very skilled. That's, that's, that's something that if you're an honest person, you could be the most extreme anti-communist ever. You can hate everything that Stalin stood for. You have to admit, the guy was quite competent on some level. And people are happy to say this about Hitler. Did you notice that? If, if you said that about Hitler, you would be the history channel. You could be the history channel and say that about Hitler. We all know that Hitler killed millions of people in gas chambers, that Hitler was a mass murdering, racist, fascist, who started a war that killed hundreds of millions of people. Hitler was evil. But if you get there and you say, well, you know, Hitler was a very good speaker and he knew how to, everyone's like, yeah, that's okay. But if you say anything good about Stalin, if you say anything good about Mao or Fidel Castro or Kim Il-sung, it's like, oh my God, you're defending. And it's like, even if you hate them, even if you don't recognize them ever doing something good, you have to admit that in order for them to accomplish what they accomplished, they must have had some skills. They must have been somewhat charismatic. They must have been somewhat, you know, somewhat effective in their, in their work, but you can't do that. And you can do it with Hitler. For some reason, you can do that with Hitler. There's no, you know, if you say Hitler, oh, well, he was a good speaker. Oh, he knew how to give good speeches. He knew how to organize people. Everyone's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's the history channel. That's, you know, college history classes. You know, Hit Hitler is, oh, you know, we, we're going to read every biography and every book. And, you know, I mean, but with Stalin, if you get anything other than mass murdering, baby eating butcher, you know, and same with Mao, anything but evil, satanic, blood drinking. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, you know, uh, Harpal Brar, who I've interviewed before, communist writer in Britain, I interviewed him. And, and in one of his speeches, I remember he said that when the bourgeoisie talk about communism, they stop sounding historical and they start sounding hysterical. And it, it's, it's totally true. And uh, as weird as it is, you know, Hitler is widely hated, you know, the majority of the human race recognizes how horrendous the Holocaust was and how horrendous Hitler's crimes were. So we all know how evil, you know, Hitler was. But for some reason, we're allowed to acknowledge that in order for Hitler to do all the evil things he did, uh, he must have been effective in some ways, but not with communists. 
You can't acknowledge that with communists. With communists, oh, no, 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 they all, they're pure satanic evil. And if you say anything, oh, my God, it's, it's the weirdest thing. It is the weirdest thing. I remember sitting there in school. The way they describe communism, it's idiotic, it's stupid, only an idiot would believe in communism. They want to divide up everything actually absolutely equally and everyone gets paid the same wage. That's retarded. You know, they don't believe in God. You know, communism is pure, pure stupidity, pure idiocy. But fascism, it's like, well, you know, Hitler was a very good speaker and he made the trains run on – it's like fascism is an understandable mistake. And communism, you just have to be an idiot. I mean it's like it's, – U.S. society is really, really slanted to the right. It's really, really slanted to the right. I mean, if you, if you don't think there's a right-wing bias in U.S. society, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it is utterly ridiculous. You know, you know, fascism and Nazism are, oh, that's an understandable mistake. And, you know, and communism is, you have to be an idiot to believe in communism. And it's like, no, you know, and again, there's not intellectual honesty here. I'm not a fascist, but I understand the appeal of fascism. I understand the arguments that fascists made. I understand what they believe. I understand the effectiveness that fascists built their organizations with because I'm honest. I can admit that, look, you know, there was a reason that the fascists were able to take power. I mean, I, I, in order to actually understand things, you have to be honest, right? You have to put aside your bias and understand things. You know, I think fascism is abominable. I hate fascism. I'm, I'm you know, appalled by fascism, but I understand it, right? With communism in the United States, you're not allowed to understand it. You know, communists are just these stupid people who think that everyone should get paid the exact same wage no matter how hard they work and human nature, duh. And it's like the way people talk about communism is so... You know, I mean, you look at the 20th century. How many millions of people fought and died for communism? How many people, you know, intellectuals, Albert Einstein, John Stein, I mean, all these people believed in communism, but they're all just fucking idiots. They're all just, oh, they're all just not smart enough to read, to watch Jordan Peterson videos. Are you kidding me? I mean, there's a lack of intellectual honesty. So I just want to throw that out there, right? You know, you know, try to cancel me all you want, but I'm telling you, with Stalin, right? You know, Stalin was obviously somebody, like him or hate him, who knew, knew what he was doing, right? He was a very, very effective organizer. I'm going to tell you about Stalin and his personality. Stalin, he was not Russian. Did you know that? Everyone thinks Stalin was Russian. He was not Russian. Stalin was from Georgia. And no, I do not mean Georgia in the southern United States. He was not from Atlanta. He was not from, not from that state right next to Alabama and right above Florida. No, 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 no. Stalin was from Central Asia. And Stalin's mother it has one of the like biggest personalities that you can ever read about. Stalin's mother is, you know, and... By the way, one of the best biographies I've ever read of Stalin is called Young Stalin. And it's by Simon Seabag Montefiore. Uh, it's called Young Stalin. And it, it's, you know, again, Simon Seabag Montefiore is so right-wing and so conservative. He's from the British aristocracy. He went to one of these elite British private schools, Eton or whatever. And so because he's so conservative and he's so wealthy and all of that, they let him write a book that kind of admits Stalin's effectiveness. And, uh, you know, Stalin, he's from a little village in, in Georgia. I think it's called Gori. He's a little, t little village called Gori. Um, and his mother, Stalin's mother, is this really, has a really strong personality. She's somebody who can do anything, practically, if she sets her heart on it. She can make anything happen, right? He's from a very poor family. Um, but Stalin's mother is just this very forceful person who can just get things done. And there are different perceptions about why. Uh, one popular story, which again, we cannot confirm, is that she had many miscarriages before Stalin was born. So she made a promise to God. She said, if I can have one, if you can let me give birth to a son, I will make him become a priest. That's one version we don't, that's not confirmed. For whatever reason, Stalin, you know, Stalin, which was not his name, right? Joseph, Yosef Yugashvili. Right? His mother was determined for him to become a priest. 
And so, even though he's from this tiny little village, even though, you know, his father's a bootmaker and an alcoholic, Stalin's mother goes around raising money to get Stalin to go to seminary school to become a priest. And so she does it. And that in and of itself, people have talked about how that is like next to impossible at that time. For a little town in Georgia, you know, an impoverished person whose father is a drunken bootmaker, a drunken guy who makes boots, and it is like next to impossible for somebody from a little tiny town in Georgia to go to seminary school and become a priest. So Stalin's mother somehow going around and raising the money, raising the money to get Stalin into seminary school is kind of amazing. It, it, it is like, you know, it's huge. And that shows how kind of fanatical his mother was. Um, you know, and his mother lived well into the time when he was leading the country. And I know Stalin at one point banned any interviews with his mother because she didn't like, she was spending a lot of time doing interviews for newspapers and in the media. And Stalin was sick of hearing his mother talk on the radio and stuff. And he actually banned her from speaking in the media, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, but, you know, Stalin's mother had this big personality, very religious woman. And she determined that Stalin should become a priest. So she somehow got him to go to seminary school. She got the money together to fund Stalin going to seminary school. And so Stalin went to seminary school, right? And at seminary school, Stalin was apparently one of the worst behaved students they had ever had. He was constantly getting into mischief, constantly getting into trouble, constantly breaking the rules. Stalin was apparently... Uh, a horrendous student at seminary school. He was constantly, constantly getting in trouble, constantly breaking the rules. Um, he was like a juvenile delinquent, uh, you know, uh, at, at seminary school. Um, you know, one of the things, and this is fascinating, they had a rule at this seminary school that Stalin was at that you could only read religious books. You could only read religious books. So Stalin went to the local village and he, he got a subscription. You could do that at, books, at the bookstore in this village. He got a subscription. So they would send him every single book they got. And he then made money selling those books secretly to all the other boys in the seminary school. He had an underground book smuggling conspiracy. He ran a book smuggling ring at the seminary school, right? And, and they weren't communist books, from what I understand. That's, that's been romanticized later, but they weren't communist books, from what we understand. They were just, you know, stuff like Victor Hugo and, you know, just novels and stuff. But he was, he was getting punished, and he was making money doing it, right? It was kind of his little, little hustle, as Gerard says. That was Stalin. And uh, he's constantly getting in trouble. Not a very good student. He's getting low grades. He doesn't get very good grades. He's not very focused, but he does learn to read and write. And that puts him ahead of a lot of people in Russian society at that time. In the Russian Empire, we're talking the Russian Empire in the 1890s, 1900s, that, that puts you pretty far ahead of a lot of people if you can read and write. So finally, he's, his mother just stops paying the bills. She's like, you know, I worked so hard to send you to priest, you know, to learn to become a priest. Um, worked so hard to do this and you're screwing around and you're breaking the rules. Um, screw you, you know, and his mother stops paying the bills. So Stalin goes to the nearby village, um, you know, the village near where, you know, his seminary school is. And there he joined the Bolsheviks and he became an organizer of industrial workers, of factory workers. Of union, he becomes a, a union organizer after he's kicked out of the village. But there's other, there's another aspect of this too, which is that Stalin and Stalin's mother and father were not together. That Stalin's father wanted him to be a bootmaker, like he was, not a priest. And so frequently throughout Stalin's childhood and teen years, his father would kidnap him. Right? I mean, this is, is one of the saddest things. So, so his mother wants him to go to priest school, maybe because she made a promise to God or maybe not. We don't know. His father, who's an alcoholic, uh, you know, wants him to become a bootmaker. And so frequently, 
you know, Stalin will, you know, go home to visit his family or whatever. And uh, from what we understand, the father would show up and take Stalin away with him and start teaching him to be a bootmaker. You know, and then the mother would go back to, you know, wherever the father was and say, no, nope, Stalin's coming with me and have him become a priest at seminary school. You want to talk about a, a confused upbringing, right? Your mother is, you know, moving heaven and earth to get the money together to send you to school, seminary school to be a priest. Your father, on the other hand, keeps showing up, kidnapping you and taking you, you know, and basically taking you against your will back to his home somewhere else to try and get you to become a shoe or a boot maker. Do you imagine that, how confusing that would be for a young man? I mean, you know, you know, the parents were not together. They were not living together, right? The parents had split apart. So, you know, and, and Stalin's mother, and, and again, you want to talk about the force of Stalin's mother. You know, Stalin's mother, the more you read about Stalin's mother, the more you read that she's this, this dynamic person, right? I mean, you know, you know, this is not a society where women are encouraged to take on leadership roles or be, you know, be, you know, so, she, so you know, her, her ex-husband is showing up and taking her son away. And then she's showing up and taking her son back from the ex-husband and sending him back to seminary school. This is like, again, you want to talk about an interesting thing, but the thing is that everywhere Stalin goes, and this, this, is, this goes right up to the time of his death, Stalin is very much a man's man right? Stalin is very much an organizer. Stalin is very much a, a, he is popular everywhere he goes. In seminary school, right? He's running this, this underground book smuggling club. And, you know, he may not be getting good grades and he may not, he may be the class clown and he may be always in trouble and, and all that, but he's popular. All the other kids think he's the coolest guy around. And that's one thing that Stalin kind of has going for him. Wherever he goes, people love him, you know? And, you know, later when he's a revolutionary organizer, he goes to prison. And the other Bolsheviks are in the prison and they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And Stalin makes friends with the other prison inmates. And he's really popular in the jail. And the other prisoners, they think he's really badass and they think he's really cool. And that Stalin has a way of just kind of getting people to like him. Right? He's charming and he can tell jokes and he can he he just knows how to get along with people. He's he's the kind of person that people like, right? He's a very charming, charismatic individual. Um, you know, and and you know, when he's in the jail, right? You know, these Bolshevik, a lot of these Bolshevik organizers are intellectuals. They're from a wealthy background. You put them in a jail cell with robbers and criminals and murderers. And, and they're sitting there, oh my God, this is terrifying. Stalin, somehow, all the other prison inmates like Stalin. This happens over and over again. Later in Stalin, you know, in his revolutionary years, he's deported, right? This is a thing they used to do to criminals and revolutionaries in Russia. They'd deport you to Siberia. Russia, they would deport you to Siberia. So they deport Stalin and Lenin, or Lenin, Bukharin, a lot of these great revolutionary leaders, they deport him to Siberia. So they're in Siberia. Right? Little, you know, Siberia. Look at a map. Look how big Siberia is, right? It's, you know, it's a big, vast amount of territory, but not a lot of people there. Um, you know, it's very spread out. And, you know, they talk about how, you know, you know, a lot of these revolutionaries are sitting there, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Well, Stalin, he goes to the local village. He makes friends, uh, you know, with, with some of the local villagers. Um, and he's so popular that they elect him the president of the hunting club. Stalin could get along with anybody, prison, you know, workers, factory workers, seminary school, you know, uh, you, you send him out to Siberia in the middle of the village, you know, Stalin, uh, you know, Stalin in the Siberian village, he makes friends with all the local Siberians. They like him so much, they make him the president of the hunting club. Right, that's I mean Stalin. He's and he, and he likes to drink. Right, he likes to drink. He likes to you know he, he's a manly man kind of you know. Um, I believe you know I believe he I believe if I'm not mistaken he had a deformed foot. One of his feet were deformed if I'm not mistaken. But he was just Stalin knew how to he knew how to to charm people. I mean that's that's really who Stalin was. He was a man's man. He was a he was an organizer. He was a popular guy. And a lot of people don't know this, but, right, in Lenin's book, What is to be Done, he pitches the idea of an all-Russian socialist newspaper. It's called Iskra, which means spark. 
Iskra was not widely read. The, the, the Iskra newspaper, the Bolsheviks, it was an ideological paper for people that were already in the Bolshevik party. However, there was another newspaper that was very widely read, that everybody read. It was all over the Russian cities. It was called Pravda. It means truth, the truth. It was a newspaper called The Truth, Pravda. After the Russian Revolution, it became the official government newspaper. But before the revolution, Pravda was this daily agitational newspaper that the Bolsheviks distributed throughout St. Petersburg. And it was this daily newspaper, Truth. Um, and Stalin was the editor of Pravda. Not, not Iskra, not the, the ideological theoretical journal. He was the editor of Pravda, of Truth. And, and a lot of what was in Pravda was what they called worker correspondence, letters to the editor. And it was just people complaining about their conditions. And it was anonymous. A lot of it was anonymous. Anonymous letters from people. Hey, at my factory, they're making us work this long. It's bullshit. I don't like it. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, hey, at my factory, uh, you know, they just got this new machine and it doesn't work. And it, and it was just people, average people, often not signing it with their real name because they didn't want to lose their job and they didn't want to get in trouble. It was average people, you know, writing writing letters, uh, you know, and that was most of what Pravda was. It was worker correspondence. And Stalin was the editor of Pravda, of the daily newspaper that people could read. Um, you know, it was this daily newspaper that agitated. It was the agitational newspaper. Iskra was the ideological paper. It was the propaganda newspaper. But Pravda was the agitational newspaper that just kind of stirred people up to a greater confrontation with the bourgeoisie. And Stalin was the editor of that, along with Kamenev. So, you know, Stalin, the, the more you look at Stalin, the more you see this is kind of a man's man. This is kind of a, a mass organizer. This is a popular guy. You know, a lot of testosterone there. You know, definitely, definitely, you know, Definitely a bro, you know what I mean? Uh, definitely, you know, but, you know, this is a guy who knew how to get along with people. He could tell jokes. He could tell stories. And he just was very, very charming. Uh, you know, and that's how Stalin was able to do what he did, right? That's, that's how he was able to do what he did. Um, you know, and put all of your thoughts about what happened when he was leading Russia aside, this is who he was, right? I just told you about how Lenin, you know, was the very nervous person, the very nervous guy, um, you know, and, and, and all of that. Well, now I'm telling you who Stalin was, right? And again, if you want to understand Stalin and the role he played in history, you have to understand the personality there. Now, one of the best stories I ever heard about Stalin, and again, if you go to Barnes & Noble, you'll find a million biographies. They're all full of unverified stories of him doing monstrous atrocities. But one of the best stories I ever heard about Stalin, which people say checks out, most likely probably did happen, right? It's not just a rumor, it's not just something, is that supposedly one day when Stalin was leader of the Soviet Union, he was walking with his daughter, right? And his daughter saw a propaganda poster with him on it. And his daughter said, oh my God, daddy, are you Stalin? And Stalin said to his daughter, supposedly, right? This is probably, this probably happened. This is not, doesn't fit the horror story. This is, you know, something that most likely happened. Stalin said to his daughter, he said, no, no, that's Stalin. That's Stalin. I'm your father. Meaning that Stalin himself knew that the propaganda, you know, and, and that's true. I mean, as much as, as much as, as much as I'm critical of the books that we all get spoon fed about Stalin, where he comes across as this atrocious monster, um, you know, the Soviet biographies of Stalin are junk. I mean, they're just, you know, they're just so, you know, sappy propaganda, uh, you know, that, yeah, you know, the, the cult of personality around Stalin, um, and the cult of personality around him wasn't very honest, right? That he was presented as, as this, you know, superhuman, infallible, godlike father figure for the nation or something. That, that, it wasn't really who he was. And he knew that. And, that, and that story, that anecdote where he says to his daughter, he says, oh, no, I'm, uh, that, I, that, that's Stalin, I'm your father. 
it's, it's sweet, right? I mean, and it shows you that on some level, you know, again, just like the cult of personality around Lenin, the image you get of Lenin is very different than who Lenin really was. The image that we get of Stalin, uh, that the Soviet government made of Stalin was very different than who he really was. And the image that we're now presented with Stalin, where, you know, and we, we're, we're presented with the image of Stalin as being Satan, you know, Satan incarnate, that's not very accurate either. 